actually volunteered for this topic. Um, I find that sometimes when I come to a meeting like this, what I go back with is not necessarily a percentage of improvement from a drug, but it's language. It's language that can help us talk with patients. Sometimes you go back with a joke or something like that, and you can use that with your patients as well. So this is not uh, peer-reviewed. This is not from PubMed. This is just from my perspective. And I've been practicing 22 years now. I don't like to think of myself as over the hill, but I might be just slightly over the hill. So that's the perspective that I'm going to bring to you today as we go through this. So first of all, I want to talk about how do you love your work? I'm going to go Oprah on you here for a minute. Number one, be grateful. Do you ever come into clinic and you think, I am going to get killed today? Maybe you're already thinking about that Monday. I've got 40 patients on my schedule. I've got 45 patients. I'm going to get killed. Have you ever done that? Is anybody thinking about Monday clinic right now? Are you guys staying another night? Who's staying another night? Oh, you're not thinking about Monday clinic. Never mind. Maybe you're going to stay in vacation a little bit. But I have really developed the practice of driving into my parking lot. And I'm a person of faith, so I drive in saying, thank you, God, that these 40 people trust me so much today to take care of their skin needs. And so however it is that you want to do that, uh, just choose gratitude. So when you look at that schedule, and sometimes you have to fake it until you feel it, by the way. Instead, right? Just fake it until you feel it. Come in with that idea of gratitude. Okay, I know number two sounds cheesy, but love your patients. Okay, this is also a choice. This is something that you can, over time, become better at. And also, I heard somebody recently say, don't see, and it wasn't about dermatology, but don't see people as tasks. Always see them, of course, as people. And I've got just a little bit of OCD. I would I bet I'm not the only one in the room that's like that. I actually highlight every person when they get to practice, and after I've seen them, I check them off. And so I'm task-oriented. I don't like to get behind. I do that. But you'll find it is so much more fun when you're in front of that patient if you're just very patient-centric at the time. Number three, this is huge. We, and we make a big deal about this at my practice. By the way, I'm not up here because this is the only way to do it or because my way is better than yours. It's just that because I've practiced as long as I have, I found some things that have worked for me. And so you may be able to teach me some things about this too. But one thing we have really practiced from the very front of the practice, from the person who is answering the phone all the way to the back, you treat people better than they deserve. We don't treat people the way they deserve. That's not the way that I want to be treated. We are going to treat people better than they deserve. And you would be surprised what an atmosphere that can create, even amongst us as fellow coworkers and employees. We are going to treat people better than they deserve. Uh, be honest. I, I had this happen recently. A lady said to me, what, you know, what is this thing? And every now and then somebody has this little bitty ditzel thing. And I don't know what that is. It's a ditzel, okay? And I looked at, she said, what is this? And I said, you know what? I don't know, but I know it's not a bad guy. And she laughed, and she said, well, I'm so glad that you just said that you don't know what it is. It actually ended up building, I think, my credibility with her. But we don't have to know it all. Be honest when we don't know it all. I would say it's okay to be wrong, but it is never okay to be dismissive or unkind. So we may have a person in one room who's had four melanomas, and in the next room, somebody is really, really bothered by their inflamed seborrheic keratosis. And of course, we're going to give that really just about as much attention as we do the other. Um, and then I've practiced a long time. I would recommend that you practice a long time because I was at the AAD in Boston, and I was talking to Dr. Laura Ferris, and she and I are about the same age. And I said, you know, Laura, I think I'm enjoying my practice right now more than I ever have before. And she said, well, Julie, you know why, don't you? And I said, no, well, no, I think maybe I've just figured it out a little bit. And she said, no, because after you've practiced 20 years, all of the patients who didn't like you have quit coming. And so now you have selected for a group of people, this is true too, they actually really like you and you like them. And the ones that don't, they're not there anymore. So uh, I hope that's not very many patients for any of us, but I would recommend that you just practice for a long time because it gets better as you go. Uh, because of the relationships that we develop with these patients. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about just some language. So first of all, the CSE, the Complete Skin Exam. 
I do way more of these than I ever thought I would when I finished my residency in dermatology. Over time, the longer you practice, I think we collect skin cancer patients. And I don't know about you, but I can't get rid of them. Not that I'm trying to. But you know, it may be somebody that I haven't found a skin cancer on them in seven years. They still want to come in at least once a year. It makes them feel comfortable. And again, you know, who am I? I don't say no to these people. So we're doing lots of complete skin exams. Now, I did put this derm light on here. I don't have any conflict of interest with them. But as I have aged and I need reading glasses and magnification, I love this thing. I also do dermoscopy. I do not look like he just said. I don't look at every single lesion with my dermatoscope. I look at the ugly duckling. And most of the time, they're not shaped like a duck. But when they are, I guess that can help us out a little bit. I did have one guy who came in, and he had a tattoo of an arrow. And at the end of the arrow was a basal cell carcinoma. That's a true story. And I always thought, man, I wish it was always this easy, where people just came in and the arrow was pointing right to what I needed to biopsy. But I've liked this thing because it's a great light and also for the magnification. But out of everything I'm going to talk to you about today, I, I actually wish that I had my three medical assistants with me today. They are awesome women. They are Jamikia, Octavia, and Shandrika, and they are just big personalities. And if they were up here with me right now, they would stop me right here and they would say, we hate when she says these three things. Because out of everything that I say, this is what stops them a little bit. So I get to the end of a skin check and I really do say, and I know this is dangerous, I say, did I miss anything that is bothering you? Right? Somebody just said, ooh. Because what are they gonna say? Well, I've been losing hair for four years, or I've had these hives that nobody else has been able to manage. So you're running a risk when you say it. But I say it anyway. It doesn't mean that I'm going to take care of the problem right then. I might schedule them back. But did I miss anything? Or I'll say, and then I do this one a lot while I'm doing the exam. Is there anything else that I need to know about what's going on with you medically? I don't want to miss anything. So anything new that you think I might need to know about. And then I think something that works particularly well is at the end of these visits, I like to summarize verbally, right, looking at the patient, what we just did. So I might say, okay, so I checked those two spots that were bothering you. They were fine. We looked at your scars from your last two skin cancers. Everything looks great there. I have refilled your desonide cream. Is there anything else that I have missed for you? And then out the door. And by the way, I can get out that door so fast if my MAs were up here again, that's what they would say. They would say, she leaves us in that room. And I do not deny that. I 100% leave them in the room. I rely on them completely to get the samples and finish everything up. I am a quick escape artist, for sure. OK, some language with sun protection. So while I'm doing the skin exam, you know, most of the time in our, in our EMR, we are putting in there that we're counseling for sun protection. So we better really be doing it. And we better do it anyway. And so while I'm looking at them, I do an open-ended, tell me how you're doing about sun protection, ma'am. And they always tell on themselves. You know, first of all, if there's a big, long pause, you know they're not doing very well, right? Um, some of them will just kind of lie to you, but you, most of the time they don't. They'll say something like, well, I know I'm supposed to use it every day, but I don't. But I use it when I play golf, and I'm reapplying at the turn. You know, so they'll kind of tell on you, tell on themselves how they're doing. And it gives me the opportunity then just to stay up. You know, again, the American Academy of Dermatology recommends broad spectrum SPF 30 every day, even on those days that you think you're going to be inside. I have, now this is not perfect. One thing I've tried with my guys, because I think the guys don't do as well as the women on this. And I think that's just because it's part of our routine. So I'll, I'll say to the guy who's struggling with this, maybe you should try like an aftershave product or something that has a sunscreen in it. And my office right next door to me is a CVS right next door. So I'll say, did you know that over at CVS, back by the men's razors, they have aftershave products back there that have SPF in them. You might try something like that. Now, I also dispense some brands of sunscreen in my practice. I can give samples of that, but I've had some success with that. I'm also an optimist. Try this one too. Okay, so I want you to try tomorrow or Tuesday, whenever it is, I want you to try being grateful. But I also want you to try this. We're going to be optimistic. Instead of scolding them or, you know, we say, are you doing better about sun protection now than you were, say, five years ago? And invariably, they all say, you know, yes, I absolutely am. And then we build on that. And I'm like, then, OK, great. I want you to keep moving forward with that. Let's get to every day. Let's wear a hat. You know, do you have a long sleeve rash guard for my tennis players? More crew necks. We need things that physically cover you because sunscreen alone is probably not going to be enough. 
but I'm so glad you're doing better. You've heard the message. Let's keep moving forward. And I frequently, you know, people will cancel us in the summer if they have a sunburn. One of my favorite stories, I have a patient and she's a very sophisticated lady, and she has had skin cancer, but she likes the sun. And evidently, I have haunted her. So one day she was, this is a true story, she was laying out on the beach, Miami Beach, and she got her reminder appointment call from my office while on the beach. That is a true story. And she came back and she's like, I can't get away from you. And she told, at least she told on herself, she told the story. But I will tell people, you know what, it is never my job to scold you. You're an adult. You get to make your own decisions. My job is just to remind you and to educate you. But I will tell you, it is never too late. Even though you might think you've already done this, the damage in the past, I can tell, and I believe that, I can tell when people start doing better about sun protection. I freeze less. I biopsy less. It's going to be a more pleasant visit for you, so it's never too late. These are just some of the products, and I don't have any conflict of interest with these. They're SPF 15s and 20s. They're not perfect, but maybe it's a good starting place for some of our patients to use a sun protection product every day. Okay, how do I counsel acne? Again, one of my favorite things to say, because I think when people come in with acne sometimes, they think that I don't think it's as important as they do. They know that we see melanoma, and they've seen those advertisements for biologics, for psoriasis, and they have acne. And so again, always about elevating the condition that is in the patient in front of you. I say, I know you don't wanna just be better, I know you wanna be clear. And that is my goal for you too. This will likely take us more than one visit. This may take more than one treatment plan, but that is our goal, that is our goal, and we are gonna work on that together. I've also for a long time said, this one, it's gonna take, this is not fast, it's gonna take about two months to see a 40 to 50% improvement, and about four months to see an 80 to 90% improvement. So you're gonna have to stick with me as we go through this. People also, once you put them on combination of a topical and an oral, which one do you think they think is doing all the work? They think the oral, sometimes we think the oral. I can tell you, if you look at studies, you will see that the topicals outperform those orals most of the time, okay? And so the language I use, because I really need them to use that topical, the topical, they will stay on that even when we finish the oral. And so I'll say the topical medication is your heavy lifter. Be consistent with the topicals. It is the topical that's doing the heavy lifting here. And then the people who wanna, you know, they wanna do scrubs, they wanna do masks, they wanna do uh, facials. And what we say to them is, let's let the medicine do the work, okay? Let's back off on some of those other things for a while and let the medicine do the work. Also, when we get people clear, and now what do we do? We're moving into maintenance therapy. We want to tell that patient, remember, stay consistent because it's easier to keep you clear than it is to get you clear. And so just some language that can help here. And then it's always nice if we can just blame other people. So I talk about this in every single acne patient. I'll say, do you know what? There's three things that everybody else wants to do wrong with acne. Number one, they use too much medicine. I hope you heard me say use just a little pea size amount, cover the entire area. If you use too much, you may get too dry and then you know, you're gonna give up. Everybody does that wrong, don't do that wrong. And then number two, people spot treat. They wanna come in and just spot treat. But think about that, if all you do is spot treat, we're not doing anything to prevent next month's acne. We're just chasing it. And so every time you use this, be sure you treat the whole affected area because we want to prevent next month's acne as well. And then number three, everybody gets this wrong. They wanna to stop too soon. By the way, we're saying all of this to the patient, even if they're 12, not to the mom or the dad over here, right to the patient. Now, mom and dad are hearing me too, and on this one sometimes I will pull them in, I'll say, don't give up in two weeks. Did you hear what I said? You know, four months is probably what we're looking at for 80 to 90% improvement. So if you go to your mom or your dad in two weeks and say this isn't working, they've just heard what I said too. We have got to stick with this. And so I think that can be helpful. Topical retinoids. I know you guys all are, this is just easy, easy. But I do think they are the best, if not maybe the only product that really is doing work is preventing new acne. And I think that language can help. That pea size amount, we're all comfortable with that. They can cause dryness in the first few weeks. I start almost everybody, regardless of what retinoid I'm using, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every other day after four weeks. If you wanna bump it up and use it every day, that's great. Yes, most of us would recommend a moisturizer before the retinoid goes on. 
before, but you can do it either before or after. Don't wax your eyebrows. I swear we say that to every patient, but they don't all hear it, right? Have you guys all seen the little, they've actually taken off more than some hair there. They've taken off some skin. And then I don't hear this one as much as I used to, but people used to say, oh, Retin-A, I've heard I can't use Retin-A in the summer, so I'm going to use it and then I'm going to stop it for the summer months. Well, of course you're not. We're going to use this year round. We're just going to do good sun protection. And then you can sometimes get some buy-in by reminding patients that these topical retinoids also work for scarring and hyperpigmentation and that macular erythema that can be left behind. Oral antibiotics for acne. So I'm a big fan of saracyclin, and what I talk to patients about with this is this is the only antibiotic that was FDA approved, designed for acne. In fact, it's not a very good antibiotic for most other things. This is for acne. It should largely leave your gut alone. This is a narrow spectrum product, and I actually say that because I think people are really concerned about antibiotics now. It's once a day, with or without food, in the studies, and I, I do use this number, 4% or less of people had nausea with this. That means 96% didn't, but if you have any problems with this, you let me know. Doxycycline, we all can do this one in our sleep, right? So however you're dosing it, and I actually do use a fair amount of doxycycline too. This is the only one of these that is a phototoxic drug, potentially phototoxic. Drives me a little bit crazy in our electronic records where there's built-in counseling and it wants to put the same counseling on all of these. Minocycline is not a photosensitizer. It's not a phototoxic drug, but doxy is. And so we look at the patient too. It also causes esophageal irritation. And we say, even if the bottle says take on an empty stomach, please don't do that. I want you to always take this one with food and a full glass of something to drink. In fact, if, if we're doing it BID, if you get to the end of the day and you realize you have forgotten to take your doxycycline, I would rather you just skip the dose and go to bed and forget about it because I don't want you to take it and then immediately lay down and go to bed. Minocycline. Oh, on, other thing on doxy though, because it's phototoxic, it, that is related to how high the dose is. It makes absolutely no sense to say, well, I'm going to stop my topical retinoid for the week that I go to the beach. But it could make sense to say I'm going to stop my doxycycline or if I'm on 200 milligrams a day, the week I'm at the beach, I'm going to go to 100 milligrams a day. And that does make sense. But the topicals, that doesn't make any sense at all. With minocycline, probably the most common side effect would be dizziness. That's also dose related. We've gotten around that a little bit by doing things like the um, extended release or delayed release products. It's all about how fast that dose hits. But we want to tell people that that, that is a potential. And then minocycline is the one that's got some potentially odd side effects out there. Hypersensitivity, drug-induced hepatitis, things like that. And it's hard to describe all of that. So I will usually just say, you know, there's some uncommon but serious things that can happen with this drug. Things like, you know, liver problems and arthritis and even fever and rash. So if you, if you develop anything and you're not sure if it might be from this drug or not, I would just want you to let us know that. And I do think those things are not very common at all. Uh, but just be aware of that. Okay, spironolactone. How are we going to counsel through spironolactone? Um, I always say this one is a blood pressure medicine. It's not FDA approved specifically to treat acne. And I tell them there is a black box warning in this drug that says in rats, this can cause tumors. I want, and I do this now even with the new top, some of the JAK inhibitors. I want you to know that I know that that is in there. And so you're not going to be surprised by this in any way. But we do have large epidemiologic studies now that really show that women who are exposed to spironolactone don't have a higher rate of breast cancer than those who aren't. That doesn't mean that, you know, in your particular family, if everybody gets, gets breast cancer before menopause, that still may stop us a little bit. But that's the discussion that we have. Okay, this can lower your blood pressure. If this drug makes you feel dizzy, you stand up and you feel lightheaded, why don't you try taking it at bedtime? Now, on the flip side, if this drug, which is a diuretic, makes you get up and go to the bathroom all night, why don't you move it and take it in the morning? Or you could always divide the dose and take it BID. All of those things are fine with this. It is important to remember to tell patients that this drug can make periods funny. Now, I think the easiest place to use spironolactone is in somebody who's had a hysterectomy or they have an IUD or they're on a birth control pill. They're basically not having periods because the number one side effect is menstrual irregularities. So if you just kind of take that out of the picture, it's easy. You can drive your dose higher and not worry about some of those side effects. But if you don't tell people that one and that happens, and I, I will admit that this has happened to me, I think that I always do a good job 
saying all this, I must not, because I've had people come back who are now going through a workup because their periods have gotten funky, and we have a really good reason why they have. So you just say to this, this can make your periods kind of funny. That's not dangerous if that happens, it's just a nuisance. Same thing with breast swelling or tender, tenderness. If that happens, it's not dangerous, it's just a nuisance. We do wanna say don't get pregnant while you're taking this, but don't panic if you do. Remember, there's never been a reported case of a problem with a pregnancy exposed to spironolactin. Granted, until recently, this was used in a much older, sicker population who wasn't getting pregnant. So as we're using it more and more in acne and down even into the, into the adolescent years, we may actually have something like this come up. But the risk for pregnancy with spironolactone would be late in the first trimester. And so we don't panic, we just stop the drug. At the outset, we say this may be slow, this may take three months to kick in, and I think it's hugely important that we say, and when it does work for you, you're gonna be on this four years. You're gonna be on this long-term. This is a long-term treatment. And some people stop right there and they don't wanna commit to something like that, but plenty of people like that. Do you have people who you give an oral antibiotic for acne and they never wanna stop it? There are people who would be just fine taking something long-term and uh, just tell them that up front. And then this drug is old, it's a generic, it should be cheap as dirt, and that's something that a lot of people find very appealing. Okay, how about oral contraceptives? I think this one's all about safety. So you look at the patient, and by the way, we should get out the blood pressure cuff and document a blood pressure in the chart in people where you're using oral contraceptives for acne. But you ask, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have migraines? Do you have a history of blood clots? And do you smoke? Those are really important questions. Do you have high blood pressure, migraines, a history of blood clots, and do you smoke? And if they say yes to any of those, they're not gonna get the birth control pill from me. I would say out of all of those migraines, they could still get it because the real contraindication, I believe is under the age of 35, migraine with aura. And so somebody has migraine, but they don't have aura, then it's not really a contraindication, but I'm gonna let their primary care or gynecologist handle that. Um, I think it's important, a lot of people who are using this even for acne are probably using it for contraception even if they don't tell us that. But the way I handle this is I'll say, even if you're not using this for contraception, be sure to take it roughly at the same time of day every day. If you don't, or if you skip pills, you're gonna bleed when you're not expecting to, and nobody wants to deal with that. So you need to take this consistently and at the same time every day. Now, the women all here know you can absolutely skip the placebo. If you're on a 21-7 pill, for example, so you got 21 days of active, seven days of, of placebo, that's when you're gonna have your period. You can skip that. So you know if the timing's not working out, you're going to Las Vegas or whatever it is, and you don't wanna have a period, just skip that and immediately start a new pack. And some people think that helps acne as well, especially if they flare during that seven day window. You gotta be a little careful with that though because insurance only wants to give you 12 months. And so you really don't need to do that every month. It is not a safety issue at all. I actually have heard, this is probably just folklore, but when the early birth control pills were being created, they, they thought women would miss having a period if they didn't put that seven day blank in there. Hello? Um, I don't think anybody would have missed that. So there's nothing dangerous about skipping that. Now, this is a good package insert to read because it teaches us what to do if you, for example, wake up Wednesday and you see Tuesday's pill. What do you do? And so the package insert says you take them both, okay? So I say this, I tell patients, I want you to read this, but if you ever wake up Wednesday and there's Tuesday's pill, you go ahead and take both of them at the same time. 36912, this has been something that I've really enjoyed um, using. I talk about it to you guys, but also to my patients. So the biggest risk of a birth control pill is a blood clot. Um, the, a person's baseline risk, if they're of childbearing potential, of having a venous thromboembolic event is three women per 10,000 in one year, okay? So you'll hear things like, oh, you know, birth control pills double the risk of having a clot, and that is absolutely true. But if you're doubling something that started out as a low risk, it is still a low risk. So if I put you on a birth control pill, I have just doubled your risk to six per 10,000 women in one year. If I put you on a pill that contains drospirinone, which is in Yaz and Yasmin and the generics, I have just tripled your risk to nine per 10,000 women in one year. But if you get pregnant, your risk is 12 
for 10,000 women in one year. And around the time of delivery, it's, a, it's actually about 30. And so anytime we're using birth control pills, if people also need it for contraception, you've got to win on the risk benefit ratio every time. It's the people who maybe really aren't using it for contraception, we're using it just for acne, that we have to kind of weigh the risk and benefit a little bit differently. This takes about three months to kick in. Usually they're free. This should be long-term treatment. And then there's good news. And I, I frequently I will talk about this. Right after we talk about the risk of blood clots, do you know that birth control pills protect against ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and colon cancer? And they do that. That onset is actually pretty quick. And even after you stop the pill, it hangs around for about another decade. So some protective effects there as well. I seem to be stuck here. There we go. I don't know if I did that or if you did that, but thank you. Okay, isotretinoin. I use a ton of isotretinoin. I hope that you do. The longer I practice, the more I use. And some, I can't go through everything I talk about with isotretinoin, but I will say this. I say this to every, at least every female, if not the, the guys too. There is only one side effect of this drug that really, really scares me. And that's the fact that it causes birth defects if you get pregnant while you're on it. You must use two forms of birth control or be abstinent for one month before you start it, the entire time you're on it, and for one month afterwards. We have to make a big deal about that every single time. When it comes to depression, I'm sure you know, we have two large meta-analyses, one that was done in North America, one that was done in Europe. Pools together all of the data that we have on depression with isotretinoin. What is the result of both of those? Depression actually improves in people who are on isotretinoin when you look at the population on the whole. I think many of us would say we even experience that in our clinic. People get better. But, and I talk about that, but I also say, now this doesn't mean that you, one individual, could not have worsening or new onset depression. You must watch for that and let me know if that happens. I do, this is important, I do want you to know it does not mean I am gonna stop the drug, okay? We are just gonna be in communication about that. I may pull your dose back for a while, we may get somebody else involved, but you do need to let me know if that happens. You're usually gonna be on this five to six months. You're not gonna get worse before you get better because I'm gonna start you at a half dose, starting at 0.5 mg per kg for that first month. You will be dry. I hope you're dry. That lets me know that it's working. So be ready with your moisturizer, lip balm, saline, nasal spray, whatever you need to do. Always take this with food, preferably with fat. I like the peanut butter idea. Uh, take it, you know, very, very least take it with a spoon of peanut butter. That's something that has fat in it. Unless you're peanut allergy, then please don't do that. But I always say here too, hey, nothing bad is going to happen to you if you take this on an empty stomach. So if you get to the end of the day one day and you realize you didn't take it, you absolutely can take it on an empty stomach. But if I'm giving you, for example, 60 milligrams a day and you take it without food, you may only get 20 milligrams of it. And, and I want you to get the full effect of this. So most of the time I want you to take it with food. Stop all of your other acne medications. And then the number I say is about 80% of people will be cured after one full course of this drug. Okay, we're coming to the end. I'm gonna skip that one. Are you so impressed with my diagram? I actually draw this every time that I'm getting ready to do surgery on a melanoma in situ. So I do my own surgeries from here down. I do melanoma in situ, even those that are less than 0.75 millimeters. But I think this helps the patient to understand. I've highlighted the DEJ there. The fact that we're not busting through that and getting down to the dermis where the blood vessels and the lymphatics are. Your prognosis is excellent. So I enjoy doing that. Uh, with Botox, okay, people come in for Botox and they have like a crater and you gotta be rude sometimes. And I say, okay, how old are you? This is their first time for Botox, how old are you? And maybe they say, I'm 56. And I'll say, you have been making that face for 56 years. Now, I think we can get rid of it, but I need you to know that's not gonna happen in two weeks. We are gonna have to quit reinforcing that thing that you've been reinforcing for 56 years. We're gonna have to quit reinforcing it probably for a year. And so I don't want you to judge this based on one treatment with your botulinum toxin, okay? Give this some time. It's likely gonna take more time to undo it. Um, I like to say things like, um, you know, these muscles are gonna quit going to the gym. They're gonna decondition over time. These are the only muscles that we want to get weaker. So the longer you do this, the less you're gonna need it. I'm out of time, so I'll go super fast, about one minute here. With alopecia, I heard somebody at a meeting use this language and I loved it. 
Our goal is that you don't lose any more hair. I hope you grow some more hair, but our goal is gonna be that when you come back to see me in a year or two years, you have the same amount of hair that you have right now. And if you grow hair, then great, that's icing on the cake. Allergic contact dermatitis, I see David Cohen over there. I heard somebody once say, um, don't ask, what, are you, what have you changed recently? What new thing are you doing? They said it makes more sense to say, tell me what you always do. I wanna know your routine because those are the things, that wasn't you, was it David? Do you say that? But it's, yeah, and I, you know, it's so easy to say, have you changed anything? And instead do it like that. Okay, the diagram and the never ending list. What I say is, I promise I am gonna look at your list when I'm done, but I, now this is taking a chance, but I'll say, but if I am worth my copay, I'm gonna find everything that you need me to find on my own. And so we do it, we get to the end, and sure enough, we've checked everything off. On the long, long list, um, we may have to have people come back. People circle things, we can write on them right back to whoever circled them. That is not a problem. We also use this in the office, and I'm gonna tell a funny story, this is the last slide. So EGN stands for extra grace needed. And so whatever it is that you flag, right? You flag the chart. The person that can be a little difficult, you flag the chart and you know they're difficult. But every now and then I go in and I just get rid of these, okay? Because maybe it was just a really bad day. I want to tell you something. I think I'm a fairly nice person. I got fired about three years ago by a Christmas tree farm, right? Not my best day. So. I can't believe I'm even telling you this. So I really love my Christmas tree. I get a, a real one. I get it flocked and pre-lit, and it is amazing. Well, evidently, there was a drought in North Carolina, so when they delivered the Christmas tree that was ordered just like the one the year before, it was about half the size. And so when I call, and I'm like, you know, this is not what I was expecting. I think maybe I need a refund on this. They basically just said, uh, no, you don't need a refund. Well, there was a drought, and, and, you know, deal with it. And they actually truly did say, Maybe you just need to take your business somewhere else. I know, and my mouth was like, I just got fired by a Christmas tree farm. And so I've actually told so many people that, but you, know, you don't wanna go around wearing the sign that says, hi, I'm Julie, I got fired by a Christmas tree farm. And so I do, we do put flags like this in the chart, but it is fun every now and then to go through and just erase them because we don't wanna mark people for how they were on their very worst day. And that's it, thanks so much.